As soon as you walk into the house, the hair stands up on the back of your neck. Something happened to him. I knew that in my heart. Kelly wore the pants in the family, so whatever she wanted, Jason did. I'm listening to Jason Cochran's interview. I actually was institutionalized a over a month ago. What happened to Chris? John with her, it was like, lie, 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 truth. I've spoken to investigators. It made them believe in pure evil. I'm not a bad person. She's going to continue this game as long as she can. The Upper Peninsula is kind of its own little world. The Upper Peninsula is separated by the Mackinac Bridge from Lower Michigan. One town is Iron River. My name is Laura Frizzo, and I'm the former police chief of Iron River. The people of Iron River are really good-hearted people, accepting. But I think when someone new comes to the area, they're a little skeptical at first. One of those outsiders who came to live in Iron River was 51-year-old Chris Reagan. Terry O'Donnell was an old flame of Chris Reagan's, and the two had recently rekindled their romance. God, I was so in love with him. So when Chris moved to Iron River, he got a job at a manufacturing company called the Oldenburg Group. Chris was former military and had a reputation as a reliable worker. So it came as a bit of a surprise when he didn't show up for his job. Two whole weeks had gone by and no one had heard from Chris. That's when Terry decides to go to the police. By this time, the two had broken up, but they remained close friends and talked regularly. I saw this vehicle pull up and park in front of the police department. And I saw uh, this woman get out of the, the vehicle, and she was crying. And she said that her friend was missing. I was shaking. I had tears. Chief Frizzo sends Sergeant Cindy Barrett to investigate. First stop, Chris Reagan's apartment. This doesn't look like Chris's apartment at all. It's all oh. just Something happened. I knew that in my heart, and I knew that in my gut. When Chief Frizzo digs deeper into Chris's life, she discovers another woman he'd been dating, a 33-year-old co-worker by the name of Kelly Cochran. I would go over to Chris's and usually cook, and then, I mean, we were intimate, and then usually I would leave. Chief Frizzo had told me to go and interview Kelly Cochran to see if she had any information as to the whereabouts of Chris Reagan. And man came out. So I said, are you Kelly Cochran's husband? And he said, yes. And shortly thereafter, this woman comes out. So I said, is your husband aware of your relationship with Chris Reagan? And she says, oh yes, he's fine with it. Jason Cochran is standing there just stoically not saying a word. Chief Frizzo asks for help from the Michigan State Police. They send two detectives who question the Cochran's the very next day. Uh, and I'll tell you guys in advance, I see a therapist for high anxiety. I actually was institutionalized a little over a month ago. Lost a close friend that I've been depressed ever since. And don't get me wrong knowing that my marriage has fallen apart. So you were very much aware of what Kelly was doing. I either had to accept it or to let her go. Kelly, right? Yes, K-E-L-L-Y. When Kelly came in for her interview, the one thing I noticed about her right out of the gate was her ability to control her body language. Tell us um, everything you know about Chris. We actually got pretty close in the last four months. Did you have an intimate relationship? Yes, we did. And obviously your husband knows. He knows. He knows. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was um, Jason upset about that? No. Kelly, she would be looking at Jason. I don't see why you would. Because husbands get jealous. Since this is a complicated case and the Iron River Police Department employs just four people, two private investigators, Jim McNeil and Molly Barron, offered to help. It was at this point where the prosecutor was ready to sign the search warrant for the Cochran residence. So Molly and Jim show up at my office, and I'm like, oh, well, as a matter of fact, I said, well, I'm going to be doing a search warrant there tomorrow. Hi, 
Hi, Jason. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. How are you? Okay. One of the first things you want to be very careful of is weapons. Do you have any weapons in the home? Not on us, but I would have weapons in the house. I've got a 22 under there. To be able to reach right in and get it. Laura calls the crime lab, and we're standing there for quite a while waiting for that crime lab. And I looked up. Is that what she said? Yeah, okay. I painted it. The ceiling was white, but there was these certain spots up there. To the private investigators, those spots on the ceiling look suspiciously like painted over blood. Um, we got a, a positive reaction with the luminol on the on the ceiling here. Also, a chilling discovery Chief Frizzo later makes inside the Cochran's basement, a journal written by Jason. And he had titled it, Where Monsters Hide. Then he goes on to talking about being a hunter and how the hunter hunts the prey and feels this tingle through their body. And it's, it's kind of eerie. <laughs> I got a phone call from one of the neighbors in the morning and said, I just want to let you know that they totally loaded up their truck and skipped town. It turns out that on the night before the Cochran's left town, those private investigators had put a tracking device on the Cochran's truck, which is legal for PIs to do in the state of Michigan. We monitored the GPS movement all through exiting the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, through the state of Wisconsin, the top part of Illinois there in Indiana, and then they ended up nearby within the Hobart area. They were back at um, Kelly's parents' house in Hobart. Chief Frizzo needs DNA samples from Kelly and Jason, so she contacts the Lake County Sheriff's Department in Indiana, who then brings Jason in to the Hobart Police Department where he gets a surprise. Hey, Jason. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. My family in Indiana. Looked up at me, and his face just started to turn red immediately. And my whole plan was to try and give him the opportunity to be the victim and to tell me what happened to Chris. Do you remember telling her, uh, if you ever loved me, you'd act like my wife? It says right in your messages, don't go back to those apartments. You're a married woman. In the meantime, actually, Kelly is just calling. She knows something's up. But with no confession and no physical evidence, Jason and Kelly walk out of the police station and resume their lives in Hobart. Wake County 911, Operator 17. Yeah, my husband, his face is like blue. He's breathing barely. I don't know what's wrong. He's throwing up. He's sweating. I need an ambulance right away. Jason was rushed to a nearby emergency room and pronounced dead. Shortly after, Jason's friend calls the FBI, suspecting something might be wrong. The FBI routes the call to the proper jurisdiction, and it lands on the desk of Hobart Detective Sergeant Jeremy Ogden. I've never received a call like that before. Jason had petechial hemorrhaging around his eyes within his, uh, the whites of his pupils. And what does that point to? Pressure and suffocation. The autopsy results lead Ogden to take a deep dive into Kelly Cochran's background and Chris Reagan's disappearance. So he connects with Chief Laura Frizzo from Iron River. Laura sent me all of the documents and the videos. Immediately I knew that this was gonna work out well because he was on the same page. Detective Ogden begins to follow Kelly. He knows she comes to a park regularly. She would just come and she would sit on that log. And there was a couple times where I thought she was even crying. So he decides to make a carving on the tree that will really freak her out when she sees it. Chris is here. I thought maybe she would see it 
as a sign from the dead or maybe even something supernatural. All I saw were her running through the woods, and then all of a sudden the truck backed out and she took off. That's the night that she decides to tell me everything. You watched him die, right? Where did he shoot him in his body? You don't know? I'm the victim. My husband was abusive. I had no choice. I couldn't. I couldn't tell anybody, or he'd kill me too. What happened to Chris? What did he do with Chris? Cut him up. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.